Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage our final panel for the day, Defending Free Speech in the Mobile Internet Age, with Jeffrey Stone, professor at the University of Chicago, Mary McCord, professor at Georgetown Univer Law, and moderated by Rebecca Rosen, senior editor at The Atlantic. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming in the last session of the day. Um, we saved the best for last, the lawyers. I know <laughs> everyone's looking forward. Uh, and we're gonna talk about some of the legal issues that have brought us to this moment where we are with our technology. So I'm gonna start with Mary, who has a very close view into what is going on on these platforms and how it is impacting the real world and real people. And I just wanna say, Mary, what are you seeing? Sure. Um, first of all, thanks for uh, sticking around for the last session. And just to kind of set this, you know, the introduction said professor. I'm not, re I mean, I'm kind of like a fake professor. So I was at the Department <laughs> of Justice for almost 25 years as a prosecutor and in national security. And now, yes, I have a, a visiting professor title, and but I really run a constitutional impact litigation shop within Georgetown Law, where we bring constitutional impact litigation across a range of areas. And the reason that's relevant, and the reason I'm telling you that, is because one of the weird niche areas that we litigate in is we litigate against extremists. We litigate, in particular, against unlawful private militias. Because um, we've seen a real rise in unlawful private militia activity over the last several years. and so. Our first big case, uh, I left the government in May of 2017. I, I was the acting assistant attorney general of national security when I left. And some of you may recall August of 2017 is when we saw the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, and we saw the use of speech, right? But we also saw it combined with massive amounts of violence and combat in the streets. We saw unlawful private militias usurping the role of law enforcement and sort of interposing themselves between the white nationalists and the counter protesters. Um, and in the aftermath of that, and of course, you know, we also saw a white nationalist use his vehicle to ram it into a crowd of counter protesters, killing Heather Heyer and uh, seriously injuring dozens others. I had just left um, doing counterterrorism uh, just a few months before that. And this all looked so familiar to me, right? Using your car to commit a terrorist attack. We'd been combating the ISIS threat from 2014 till, till and beyond after I left. And we'd seen vehicles being used for terrorist attacks. And you know why vehicles were used for terrorist attacks by ISIS? Because ISIS was using social media and the internet and private forums on the internet to encourage terrorist attacks using your vehicles. How easy. You don't even need a weapon. You can just use your vehicle. That same type of of um, solicitation and propaganda over social media is what we then saw at ICAP, where Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection, where we were observing what happened at the Unite the Right, and in, in thinking how could we respond to that, we started doing research, pulling the types of social media, the planning that had gone into that event, and this was all very well planned. Not that James Fields himself was going to use his car, but in the, what we saw is that on social media, that is where the recruitment had taken place. That is where spreading you know, disinformation and lies and, and rumors about, um, th about the whole reason for the rally, which you may or may not know, was supposed to be to oppose the city's decision to take down Confederate monuments. Um, and they, but really, it was an opportunity for the far right, nas far white nationalists, to far right white nationalists, to step out of the virtual space and into the public space. And we saw that in the social media, right? This disinformation, this planning, um, specifically planning for this not to be a free speech event but for this to be the opportunity, and this is a quote, to crack some commie skulls, right? The idea was we will provoke counter protesters to throw that first water bottle or that first punch, we will respond with massive violence, and then we will invoke self-defense, and of course we'll do this all in the name of our First Amendment rights and free speech. And we saw planning for the militias, we saw planning for the building of shields and forming phalanxes, like I'm talking about like ancient Greece phalanxes, 
for white nationalists to use these as offensive weapons against the counter protesters. And looking at that, you know, in the immediate aftermath, you, you had commentators sort of throwing up their hands. Well, First Amendment rights, Second Amendment rights, what could the government do? And it struck us as constitutional litigators, well, the First Amendment doesn't protect violence, it doesn't protect threats, it doesn't protect incitement to imminent lawless activity. Second Amendment protects your right to bear a firearm for individual self-defense, but not to be a private army of civilians who decide they're gonna take up AK-47s and, and AR-15s and go, go out in public and boss other people around or, or do anything like that. So we did bring a successful case um, against the militias and the white nationalists and we obtained court orders to prevent them from returning to Charlottesville in groups of two or more acting in concert with any kind of weapon during any protest, rally, or march. And you might be thinking, wait a minute, what about First Amendment rights? And one of the things key there, I am gonna get to your question, I promise, <laughs> is the court, in ruling in our favor, made it clear this doesn't violate First Amendment rights. People can still go out, they can still exercise their right to free speech, but that doesn't entitle them to engage in these acts of violence or form their own private armies to engage in acts of violence or to uh, usurp the role of law enforcement. Right? So level setting on the First Amendment is, is something that you know, a lot of lawyers in this area are trying to do, are trying to make sure that we have a proper understanding of the First Amendment, but what we've seen it happened before Charlottesville, but we've seen increasingly since Charlottesville is this use of social media, the internet, private forums, chat rooms on the internet by extremist groups within the United States, conspiracy, conspiracy theorists, white supremacists, accelerationist groups, anti-government groups, private unlawful militias to do all the same things that when I was still at DOJ, I was seeing ISIS do, right? Which is to spread disinformation, recruit people, monetize by you know, raising money, propagandize, and plot and plan. And so these are, you know, th these are tried and true sort of um, modus operandi of terrorist groups. I'm not saying all of our extremist groups in the US are terrorist groups, they're certainly not, but it's taken, uh, it's adopted by extremists within the US. And it has real world harms, right? So for example, in the last few years, to get to actually your question, what are you seeing? Because of the work we've done in this area, a lot of people around the country will call when, when, when they're worried about something. First it used to be, I'd get, you know, we'd get a call from a, a city attorney or a police chief saying, oh, we've got a White Lives Matter <laughs> rally this weekend or a KKK rally. We know there will be counter protesters. We don't want to be another Charlottesville. What can we do to protect public safety while not getting running afoul of First Amendment rights? But in 2020, it sort of shifted and it was community members calling and saying, you know, our local high school tried to have a racial justice demonstration and they were met with, by you know, groups of armed men with AR-15s intimidating their freedom to speak, intimidating their exercise of constitutional rights. Is that legal? Um, and then we would talk about the Second Amendment, the First Amendment, what, what kinds of things that governments can do, content neutral time, place, and manner restrictions on speech for public safety reasons when there's a compelling government interest, and we can come back to that. But some in, in some cases, though, we've seen really, really tragic results. For example, in Idaho, I've had multi multiple people who, because they stood up against, uh, you know, against extremists there, then became trolled and uh, had disinformation about them put out over the met internet had correct information, their names, their photographs, their addresses, where their children go to school, urging others to come and threaten them. And I know of two people alone in just one small town in Idaho who were forced to move to actually place they had lived for more than two decades to move someplace else because of the constant threats and harassment. If you think about the shooting in Kenosha, uh, this was during a racial dem justice demonstration when uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, who had gone to join up with some private militias there to protect property against uh, what they rumored to be violent, uh, you know, um, Antifa thugs. Uh, that, and of course it resulted in a shooting, two people killed, another seriously injured. That was all planned over the internet, right? It was, 
uh, and this is recounted in great detail by our friends at D Digital Forensic Research Labs who you know, pulled the social media, the Facebook posting from the 24 hour period before that racial justice protest where unlawful militia groups and other extremists said, get here, get here with your AR-15s, we're gonna be out protecting against um, you know, the, the, these violent uh, demonstrators. And that had real world cons consequences. And I could give you example after example after example of actual real world harm. So as we get into this discussion about the First Amendment, it's important that we're not just talking now about speech for speech's sake, or what is the remedy for hateful speech or harmful speech, more speech, because we're talking now about speech that, that actually can end up significantly harming people. Thank you for that. Um, Jeff, Mary went through a whole bunch of different First Amendment concepts and what she just described. Can you give us a, a sense of what is the legal architecture that's behind, what is the First Amendment jurisprudence we have that has resulted in the spaces that we have online today? Just a broad overview. Sure. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, the First Amendment says that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Now, there are at least two strange ambiguities in that text. First of all, it says Congress shall make no law. And the question is, does that mean that the executive branch, administrative agencies, the judiciary could not violate the First Amendment, only Congress could? That's a question that the courts moved away from pretty quickly and said it means the federal government shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech of the press. Um, then after the 14th Amendment was enacted, uh, which basically limited the states, uh, the courts eventually held that the 14th Amendment made this, the First Amendment applicable to the states, and it should now be read as no government shall abridge the freedom of speech or of the press. So that includes states and cities and public schools and police departments and so on. Uh, the second inherent ambiguity is the literalist of the test text. Uh, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean that government may not in any way or any time or in any manner restrict the freedom of speech? That's kind of what it sounds like. Um, Oliver Wendell Holmes, in the first opinion ever written by the Supreme Court about the First Amendment, um, used his famous hypothetical of the false cry of fire in a crowded theater to demonstrate that you could punish that person, that the First Amendment should not be taken literally. And what we need to do is to define the freedom of speech that may not be abridged. And of course, with that, you're in the middle of nowhere. Um, so over the years, the Supreme Court has embraced a series of principles about the meaning of the freedom, freedom of speech. Um, the first and most important one basically states that government may not punish someone for expressing a particular point of view unless the government can prove that the speech created a clear and present danger of grave harm. That was the approach that Holmes and Louis Brandeis uh, first embraced in the 1919, 1920 years. But the Supreme Court didn't embrace it until 1969. And that has been the law ever since. And as a result of that standard, no speech has been prohibited or punished in a case upheld by the Supreme Court since 1969. That test is so demanding and so rigorous because some of the cases the court held had to do with World War I, with the, um, the Red Scare, uh, and they basically came to understand that we don't trust ourselves and we don't trust the government to punish speech that is antithetical to the values of our society on the claim that it will cause harm because it'll be exaggerated by the prosecutors, the jurors will be unsympathetic to the speakers, and we have to have an extraordinarily tough standard. And is that the explanation <laughs> for the kinds of speech Mary is right. describing? And so what it basically says is, Speech can cause lots of harm, and the government can't intervene because we don't trust the government to make the judgments about which speech to punish and which speech not to punish. The one major 
limitation on that principle is what's called low value speech. That is, the court recognized that there are certain types of speech which by their very nature are not meant to be protected or seriously protected by the guarantee of the First Amendment. And this includes speech like uh, false speech, um, incitement to crime, explicit incitement to crime, um, uh, uh, obscenity, um, and the like, it's a few categories. Those categories of speech can be punished without proving a clear and present danger of grave harm. So if somebody libels you, um, you can sue them and recover damages uh, without having to prove that they created a clear and present danger of grave harm with their, with their false statement. Um, but that, those are small categories. And they are sometimes involved in the disputes over social media. Um, but at least in the types of issues that Mary was talking about, they're not at the core necessarily of that. So <clears throat> another point worth understanding um, is that newspapers, magazines, um, radio shows, TV shows, um, if they allow a third party to, to publish a letter to the editor in their journal or their newspaper, or if they allow someone to put an advertisement in their newspaper uh, or on their radio station, they can be held liable just as the individual who posted the letter to the editor. So if the letter to the editor that includes a, a prohibitable threat, then the Atlantic can be held accountable for publishing that. Um, so the, the medium that permits the speech can be held liable for prohibitable speech. That's important when we get to social media. Um, one other point worth making is the question of to what extent can the government intervene to improve the functioning of the media. So this issue became important in particular with the advent of radio and then later television. Um, Congress recognized that when radio first came into existence, that in any given city, for example, there were only two or three frequencies that could be used. And if this were regarded as private property, then some rich person could come in, buy the three frequencies, and completely dominate the communication on radio in that location. And this Congress understood was dangerous to a well-functioning democracy. And so Congress enacted um, the Radio Act, um, which basically provided, and then extended to television, it basically provided that uh, government can regulate the speech on these mediums, um, the government licenses the people. They don't buy them, they don't own them. They have to get a license from the Federal Communications Commission, which was created. And there are rules like the Fairness Doctrine um, and the requirement of being fair and balanced. So if you listen to radio or watch TV through the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, and to some extent even today, um, what you saw was a much more even-handed, much more balanced on all of the stations presentation. If they allowed a candidate on one side to, to, um, to speak, they had to allow a candidate on the other side to speak. Um, and that was accepted as constitutional, and the Supreme Court upheld it on the ground that the government owns the airwaves, and it therefore has more d discretion to control those airwaves than it does um, uh, movie theaters or newspapers or magazines. Um, and so for a long period of time, that dominated the way radio and television operated. At the same time, the Supreme Court held that government could not do that to newspapers or magazines um, or to cable um, because they were not owned by the government. And therefore, government could not intervene and, and impose a fairness doctrine on newspapers or magazines. They were free to have ideological biases, and unlike ABC and NBC and CBS, um, they, they could have their own ideology and they could say whatever they want and they can be as radical as they wanted or as uh, conservative as they wanted. Um, so a huge difference between broadcasting and other means of communication. Now the Reagan administration got rid of the Fairness Doctrine and so there's less of that kind of control now 
<coughs> than there was until the late 80s. But in your view, some amount of regulation would be possible, and we could extend that today further to the social media. Well, that's the question. Um, in, in the context of social media, um, the government has not extended that control. Um, and it's unlikely that the Supreme Court would uphold that, because they would say the government doesn't own social media. Maybe we should just buy the internet. Well, yeah, go for it. Um, but anyway, the reality is under today's law, presumably the government could not impose the same kind of limitations and restrictions as it was able to do with broadcasting. Um, and this court would be particularly unlikely, I suspect, yeah. to uphold that. Um, so, but let me say one other thing. The um, Section 230. Yeah. The other thing that's distinctive about um, the internet, social media, is that in 1996, um, Congress uh, enacted Section 230, which basically provided two critical things. First, social media platforms can, unlike newspapers, TV stations, magazines, cannot be held liable for the speech of the people who post on their sites. So unlike the Atlantic, which could be held liable for allowing a letter to the editor that has a threat on it, um, Facebook cannot be held liable because of Section 230 if, 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 if someone puts a threat on, on Facebook. The person who put the threat up, in theory, could be prosecuted for doing so, but Facebook has no legal liability for that. The rationale for that was that there was, the goal was to create this extraordinary new opportunity for individuals to speak uncensored by the intermediary, that it would be like an enormous public park in which anybody can go out there and speak, and there was no one who had to give their approval before they said whatever it is they wanted. If they said illegal things, they could be punished, but the operator of this 100 million mile park could not be held responsible. And it was meant to be an enormous opportunity for all of us to be free to reach out and to communicate with far more people than we ever could before. Um, and the second part of the Section 230 provision held that internet companies um, had the freedom to remove any, any speech that they wished to do so without being held liable to the people whose speech they removed. Um, and so much of the challenge with the internet is the fact that Section 230 gives them the power to not be responsible for what you or I post. Um, and if they were responsible, one of the problems with that is how are they going to, to look at everything that gets posted? I mean, there are literally billions of things on Facebook every day. How are they realistically going to screen them all? So that's part of the challenge that we're facing. And so what are your thoughts on reforming or repealing Section 230? And what do you think the impacts of those changes would be? So uh, Lee Bollinger, the president of Columbia, um, and I are long, longtime colleagues. We clerked at the Supreme Court at the same year. And we've been friends ever since. And we've published a number of books together. And we have one coming out this summer called Social Media, Freedom of Speech, and the, F the Future of Our Democracy. And it consists of a, a, a collection of about 20 essays um, by very distinguished people, um, ranging from Hillary Clinton and uh, um, uh, Cass Sunstein, David Strauss, um, other people in Congress, uh, Amy Klobuchar, uh, Sheldon Whitehouse, and so on. And then it has a commission with eight people who, having read all these various essays, uh, came up with a set of recommendations for what we should do. And this group, again, included people like Hillary Clinton and Russ Feingold and, and so on, um, Marty Barron. And th the recommendations include um, a couple of steps. First, they say that what Congress should provide is in order for a social media platform to have the protection of Section 230, they have to agree to two critical things. First is they have to um, agree that if someone reports to them that there is something on their website that is actionable, that's unlawful, that they then have to have an independent agency review that allegation and decide independently whether this particular post has to be removed. And 
this would be a way, if they want to keep Section 230, as they all would, um, they have, they'd have to do that. Um, and uh, the second thing um, is to have them have to create a, uh, as a group, an independent agency that would oversee all of their activities. And they would have to reveal to this agency, which would be governed by a federal agency, like the Federal Communications Commission, all of their um, actions, including their algorithms. Because one of the fundamental concerns about social media is they use algorithms to give you more and more and more posts consistent with what you've liked. And so that's an important part of the polarization that we're seeing in our society now. They use these algorithms because they want people to look at their, at their site more and more often. And what they've learned is they're likely to achieve that goal by giving people more and more of what they want to read and what they want to see. And this radicalizes people on the left and the right because they only see things that will make them happy, ideologically. Or angry. <laughs> or angry. Um, Mary, Jeff has described what is really an extraordinarily broad protection of freedom of speech and press in this country. And um, even within a regulatory framework like that, it still is a remarkable, mar remarkably free system um, and much to admire in that. I'm curious for you, as we've seen the rise of social media over the past 15 years um, and the different dynamics that have emerged online, how have your views on the First Amendment changed? Have they changed at all with these new technologies? Well, what, what, it, what I think the new technology has made clear is that our First Amendment jurisprudence, as Jeff has just discussed, is really outdated, right? It just has not really caught up to the times. So, for example, the, the test uh, that, that Jeff stated that comes from Brandenburg v. Ohio, and, and you know it basically protects almost all types of speech, e even really abhorrent speech, speech that most of us would think have no value at all. It does have the exception that he mentioned, and I just want to be super clear about it, because I think a lot of times people forget what these words are of this exception. And it's that it, the First Amendment just doesn't protect, just doesn't protect at all violence, threats or incitement, it's not even incitement to violence, incitement to imminent lawless activity. So for ex that's why, if, if, because there are plenty of crimes, for example, fraud is a, is a classic one that, that has elements of speech to it, right? Most frauds are because somebody misrepresented something. They did, committed the fraud either in a commercial sense or some other sense. They used the wires or the mails and you've got a federal crime. Um, and there's obviously a speech element to it, but that's not protected speech because that's criminal speech. So there, there is speech that is unlawful, right? But it's stuff that has been categorized so in such a way that, that it has been upheld by the Supreme Court. I think that what, what has not caught up yet is what is this concept of imminence when we're talking about the internet? Because part of the, prob part of the problems leading to the cases that Jeff was talking about involved old cases like sedition and things like that, where the harm the government was identifying wasn't imminent. It was like, if you allow this speech, anti-war, anti whatever it was, it will have these harms down the road. And the Supreme Court was saying, essentially, no, 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 too abstract, not, you know, free speech is, is, is more important here uh, as a principle. It's foundational to our Constitution. It's foundational to our democracy. These harms are not imminent enough. So they put that word in there, imminent. But how do you assess imminence when now, you know, one tweet, if you have a large platform, like some of the those who are most likely to engage in spreading disinformation and violent rhetoric, one tweet can be seen in, you know, seen by not just millions, but even billions of people in nanoseconds around the world. And it can then be amplified by those people. And so, and we know from some of the examples I gave and plenty of others that, that people out there do act on what they read on social media. Um, every single terrorism case we brought between, uh, in my entire tenure in the National Security Division, so from the time ISIS declared its caliphate till I left in 2017, but I think every single 
crimes since then, every single one had a social media component to it. The person was either recruited on social media or he became radicalized on social media. He was encouraged to, to commit some sort of, you know, first he was encouraged to travel to Syria to join ISIS there, later was encouraged to stay right here in the US, use your car, use your firearms, they're ubiquitous, you can get them anywhere, commit your crimes right here in the US. Almost every uh, shooting, mass shooting that we've seen, act of domestic terrorism, the El Paso shooting, the Tree of Life synagogue, even if there weren't a, a recruitment effort, there is social media um, radicalization in that person's background. The forensics uh, examinations of their social media after these crimes show intense um, engagement with uh, extremist material. And, and also, Many of them have written these manifestos that write, are admiring other extremists, including in other con countries who have done things like, you know, post their massacres before they got taken out, live stream their massacres before they got taken out, post their threats and those kind of things, right? So we know that there is a direct correlation between this speech on social media and real world actions. Now, granted, some of this, what I was just, that I was just mentioning would not be, protected by the First Amendment, right? Like, ask, you know, actually soliciting someone to commit an act of violence clearly is, is not protected. But others, that radicalizing Would speech be. that ends up inspiring the action. And again, this, you know, Director, FBI Director Chris Ray has told us where the real threats lie right now, but it is content neutral, right? Extremism that leads to violence as a means to addressing grievances is still extremist violence and is not protected. The threat comes from a particular segment of the population right now, but I'll leave that to Director Ray to get into. Um, and, and so we see those real world consequences. So the question in my mind is, at what point, if ever, will the courts start taking up and reevaluating this question of imminence? Now, of course, lower courts, they're powerless to do anything because the law comes straight from the Supreme Court. Um, so that's one issue. Another, another, ish, another thing that I've been thinking about a lot is um, when we are talking about social media, we tend to immediately go into this frame of, freedom of speech. And that's very purposeful on the, on the part of the platforms. They want the public to believe that they are bound by the First Amendment. But as Jeff told you, they're not. They're private companies. First Amendment applies to governments and you know, state speech, right? So it's the state that can't discriminate based on viewpoint. Private tech companies can, can discriminate all, the want, all they want so long as it's not done based on protected class, right? Like, you know, race, religion, gender, that kind of thing. That just like anyone in the private sector can't discriminate on those types of, of bases. But the, um, so they, they market themselves as being a bastion for, first, for free speech and that, that this is, you know, their, uh, this is consistent with the Constitution. They won't say required by it, but consistent with it. And I think many people think that they are bound by it. So first thing is they're not. So if we start thinking of, about our social media and our tech platforms as companies, why don't we think about them more from a consumer protection point of view, right? If I make baby cribs, I have to foresee how my baby crib might be misused, it, how somebody might not read the instructions uh, that I put on them and might still misuse it. And if harm results, I get sued and I'm responsible for that. Um, social media is a consumer product. It is marketed to consumers, it is used by consumers. And there was precious little forethought as social media developed, partly because of Section 230, 230 of the Communications Decency Act, but, but partly because just no one was thinking of it this way, there was precious little thought given to how it could be misused, how it could be people would violate community standards, real people would be harmed, right? And, and when you think about the way consumer products are regulated, I mean, we put that burden on the manufacturer to foresee those things and to do something about those things. We don't put any of that burden on our tech platforms right now. So I think part of as we think about, um, this isn't really a different way of thinking about the First Amendment, it's a different no. worry, way of thinking about these Regulation. platforms. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's just something that we've talked about a lot today, which is that these companies are profit motivated and a lot of the designs that they've deployed have been to to sustain engagement, but that has meant playing to some of the more base impulses of the population. So I think what you're saying is if there's a way to regulate them so that they 
are moved away from that specific business model, you might see different algorithms. Yeah, algorithms is a classic example, right? I mean, they know, if they didn't foresee it to begin with, they certainly now know. It's been well documented by research, you know, the, the, the harmful effects. And that was even, you know, before Frances Haugen uh, revealed what she revealed about Facebook. And I understand she'll be speaking tomorrow, which would be incredibly interesting. But, you know, they, they've built their models on this. And, you know, if you think of an algorithm like any other product development, right, you've got to think, how can it be misused? And regulating algorithms as, as Jeff was, was mentioning, is, is one of the ways at, at getting at, at this. Um, one thing I want to ask you guys, this is obviously a com uh, conference about disinformation, but disinformation is really one bucket of the problems that we see on social media. I mean, you've, you've talked about a whole, there's incitement to violence, there's harassment, there's fraud. Uh, I'm curious for the list of, uh, there's the just the anger and the psychological uh, harm that is caused by, uh, by these platforms. Do each of these necessitate different ways of thinking about speech and uh, regulation either from the government or from the companies themselves? Or is this really just like one big problem that all goes back to the core business here? Well, I'll be interested in Jeff's thoughts on this, but just to, to start us off, you know, it used to be, I think these were bucketed a little bit more, in terms of what I see in the real world impact, bucketed a little bit more. Um, there were purveyors of disinformation, there were purveyors of you know, white supremacists, great replacement theory, there were Holocaust deniers, you know, you, et cetera, et cetera. Straight up just anti-government uh, extremists, anarchist extremists. Um, but what we've seen, particularly starting in 2020, was just a real coalescence of different extremist movements in a way that I certainly hadn't seen before in, in, you know, in my work. Because um, ordinarily, you know, these groups, they, they bicker, they don't, dis they don't agree on everything, but they really cast aside a lot of their differences in order to consolidate and to coalesce. And they did that often around disinformation because it really, you know, things were already leading up to more and more polarization, more and more political violence in the US. But with the pandemic and the immediate spread of disinformation about the pandemic, you know, that then allowed extremists across the board to really join forces. So when you saw things like the assault on the state house in Lansing, Michigan in opposition to Governor Gretchen Whitmer's stay at home orders, yeah, we had militia extremists there. There were white supremacists there. There were neo confederates there, right? There were, you know, conspiracy theorists there. And that's what we've been seeing on and on and on. And it was in response to a, a lot of, you know, some of it was legitimate, some of the grievances were legitimate protest grievances, but since then we've seen the disinformation about, you know, uh, the source of, of the, of the um, virus, vaccines, masks, all this disinformation as a, as a coalescing narrative for multiple extremist groups to, to get behind. We saw the same thing after George Floyd was murdered, and we saw all kinds of, you know, um, rhetoric and disinformation about different de demonstrations and about violence, who was responsible for the acts of violence that were occurring, who was responsible for the destruction of property, again, brought so many of these groups together. And of course, you know, the biggest of all so far, at least, was the disinformation about the 2020 election itself, seeded even before the election with the narrative that anything you know, other than a win for Donald Trump would be the result of a rigged election, doubled down on after the election. And if you look at the footage, and I'm sure everyone here has, of January 6th, you will see extremists of every single stripe there. But that disinformation, that was the uniting force yeah. that brought them to January 6th. Jeff, I'm curious for your views. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to understand uh, why the Supreme Court has been so skeptical about allowing organizations or individuals to be held accountable for disinformation or misinformation, except in very narrow circumstances like perjury and fraud and defamation of an individual. Um, when you're talking about public speech, what the court has been quite concerned about is do you trust the government to decide whom to prosecute? So imagine the Trump administration having the authority to decide what is false on social media. Mm 
So you want to give them the power to make that decision. And given the fact that they got to a point that all the judges, do you trust the judges to, to deal with that? And so one of the fundamental insights that the court has had is that, of course, truly false speech is damaging in lots of ways. But if we give the government the power to decide which speech or which false speech to prosecute, then we run an enormous risk of them completely restructuring public discourse and allowing the false speech they like and disallowing the false speech they don't like. And the other question is, is it even false? Because there too, oftentimes, um, people could disagree about whether it's false. Um, we may think something is false, but others may think it's not false. Um, and, you know, COVID examples. Uh, a lot of people, 30%, 40% of the population, believe that what we believe is true is false, right? And, you know, do you want them to be sitting on jurors and deciding these things? So a lot of the reluctance to go down this road is the fear that if you do this, you know, if you allow a politician who makes a false statement in running for re-election to be prosecuted for making a false statement, the government's going to decide whom to prosecute. And they're not going to prosecute candidates on their party. They're only going to prosecute candidates on the other side. So that's part of the reason why the court has been so reluctant to go down this road, because they see an enormous danger from it that ultimately could threaten democracy in an even more serious way than what we have now. All right, well, that's going to bring me to my last question before we go to the audience. But uh, my question for you, clearly many of the, speech, the concerns we have about speech on the internet um, stem for our, uh, from our concerns about American democracy and its health for the long run. I'm curious if you, looking at the range of issues that American democracy faces, if you could address one thing, if you could reform one thing, wave your magic wand, would you start with the speech and social media problems we see online, or are there other places that you would shore up American democracy? Who do you want to answer that? Both of you. I can never pick one thing. <laughs> My kids know, like, I don't have favorites. It's impossible <laughs> for me. Um, well, OK, so let me say, what are the other things that would be on your list besides just this question of social media and speech? Yeah. Well, I, actually, I, you know, I'll, I'll stick with your question. I mean, I do think. The regulation problem is hard for the for the reasons we've been discussing. The First Amendment, you know, First Amendment is what makes us different from a lot of other countries, and it is very valued. I mean, sometimes when I speak, I feel like I'm coming down too hard on it, but partly that's because I, I want to try to correct some of the misinformation. It about comes it. from a place of love. Yeah, it comes from a place of love. Um, but you know, it, it, it is extremely important. It is very valued. But what we're seeing now, it, you know. I talked about individual harms to people, but we're seeing harms to democratic principles and democratic processes, right? We're seeing disinformation is what is, you know, right now causing many, well, first of all, threats over social media, causing many people involved with administering our elections uh, to flee their jobs, and they're being replaced by people who, because of disinformation, are denying still the results of the 2020 election. So imagine, um, and there's sort of a grand, you know, ban and plan on this, and we're seeing it at the precinct level, we're seeing it at the county level, we're seeing it people running for secretaries of state, people who actually are deny the results of the 2020 election. So I think that one of the reasons that you know, we ultimately, even after violence on January 6th, had a peaceful transition of power in 2021 is because people in those positions did their jobs. Under immense pressure not to do their jobs, they held firm, they held fast, they certified the vote as they saw them. No uh, material fraud has been revealed anywhere across the country. Individual isolated instances, no one of which would have changed the outcome. If instead, in 2024, we have election deniers at that precinct level, at that, at that county level, at that secretary of state level, um, we could be in for real, real trouble. And so this isn't all come back to social media, but the disinformation was 
amplified, propounded, spread with, with social media. If, if it weren't for social media, I, I don't think it would have been possible for that kind of false narrative to take hold. Now, how we regulate that is a tougher question, but the, the, the damage, the harm is significant. Jeff? I mean, I, I think social me media poses the greatest threat to our democracy today. Um, and I think it's the algorithms that are most troubling. Um, it, it is the polarization and radicalization of people because they have their views reaffirmed, 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 reaffirmed over and over again by the platforms that intentionally send them what they want to hear because that feeds them into coming back and coming back and buying products that are also being uh, served to them. And uh, I, I think that a change in the, in the algorithms by law that basically says you have to send people either a certain set of random posts or you have to send them ideological posts on both sides. The Fairness Doctrine did that. If, you, if, the, if the radio station or the TV station presents one side, it has to present the other. And I think that had a, a, an enormously positive impact on our democracy because people moved relatively towards the, the middle because they heard both sides. And I think that that's what we need today. Um, and you know, I, a lot of people won't listen or even read things coming from the other side, but some will. Mm -hmm. And over time, more of them might, might do so. And that would alleviate, I think, the greatest problem that's caused by social media. All right, we're opening up to the audience for questions. Is that on? Um, hi, my name is Nick Sawyer. I'm an emergency doctor from California, and um, I work with the group, um, and we are working on ensuring that the doctors who are spreading COVID-19 disinformation are held accountable. Um, when, in July, the Federation of State Medical Boards put out a statement that said that physicians who spread COVID-19 vaccine disinformation and misinformation are at risk of having their license revoked. But since that time, we haven't actually seen any of the worst purveyors of disinformation have their license provoked, revoked. In California, um, in the Medical Practice Act, what gives the medical board their authority to discipline uh, physicians, there's actually statute on the books that says that physicians are not allowed to um, spread false information. But not only is the California Medical Board not done anything to discipline these doctors, no state medical board has. So my question is about um, uh, free speech in the context of professional free speech and false speech. Thanks. You wanna go ahead? So professional speech can be regulated in ways that ordinary speech cannot. Um, lawyers and doctors, for example, can be uh, disciplined for engaging in speech that is regarded as non-professional because they have licenses from the state to be able to do things the rest of us can't. I'm a lawyer, but uh, <laughs> as is Mary, right? But um, uh, because they're given certain powers, there is an expectation that they can be regulated in a way that ensures that they use those authorities, those powers in a responsible and professional way. And um, uh, therefore, if a lawyer is found to have lied to a court, he could be suspended or disbarred. Um, I would imagine the question in terms of, of COVID is the reluctance to say something is false when a significant percentage of doctors think it's true. And I would think that that's probably, I don't know anything firsthand about this, but I would think that's probably what gives a, a sense of reluctance to the disciplinary process. Um, that if it was one doctor doing something that everybody else regards as crazy, I could see them just borrowing something and taking away his license. But um, if a significant percentage of doctors disagree, then the argument is that's free speech. And you can't just shut it down because you, the majority, don't like it. So I, I see where the complication comes in. While we're waiting for another hand to go up, can I add, not to the medical, but it's made me think that um, it's worth adding here another area where there is uh, restrictions that are permitted is public employees, including law enforcement. Um, yes, public employees have right to 
free speech. But the Supreme Court has been clear that public employees, if they engage in speech that undermines the effectiveness and efficiency of the public agency, undermines its mission, including law enforcement, they can be disciplined for that including firing termination or not hired for that. So this sometimes I fear right now, you know, we do have some extremists within law enforcement. By and large, law enforcement is not filled with extremists, but we've certainly seen examples. January 6th, there were active duty law enforcement that were there. Same, same with military. Military can also restrict speech. So I think too often we're seeing law enforcement sort of hide behind the First Amendment as, oh, we can't take any action against officers who are, you know, engaging in white supremacist speech or anti-government speech or those types of things, they actually can. Um, and so just, you know, it's not about doctors, but there are areas where with your job, there are some restrictions. I'm Jahan. I'm an alumnus of the college and the Harris School, and I've since co-founded a media startup. And my question is about how you, you discussed how we don't trust the government to decide what is false. and what gets prosecuted, so if that's true, why should we trust social media companies like Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk or, or any large corporation to do that job if we don't trust the government, or sh should we? Well, we've always done that with the media. Our, our position has always been that there are enough media outlets there that if, 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 if the Atlantic write something that is seen by the Washington Post as inaccurate, the Washington Post can write something on the other side. Um, and also we think that most of the media are re reasonably responsible in trying, because that's, that's how they get business. And that's not true for all media, of course. But I, th I think the notion is there is the kind of um, back and forth public discourse uh, that enables individuals to get both sides of the question. Um, and that's also true, to be fair, um, on social media. Um, if you want to get the other side of anything, you can get it. It doesn't take more than 15 seconds. The problem is people, our citizens, don't care. They choose to believe certain things, and they're not interested in the possibility that what they're liking is wrong. And that's part of what we have to change. And part of changing that is, is educating people, is trying to get them to understand the danger of this attitude, which has become much more prevalent than it's been in the past. I think we have time for maybe one more. There's one over there. Oh, one over here, too. Uh, I'm a student at the college. I was going to ask about how you guys feel about um, your optimism or pessimism for the ability of regulation to handle emerging technology. And to elaborate a bit, you know, if you had asked me, I think the ideal time to regulate Facebook would have been 10 or maybe even 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's only something now that's being talked a lot about lawmakers, by lawmakers. Um, so, you know, I guess the concern would be we have technologies that people don't even know about that are being developed right now in Silicon Valley that might be as disruptive as Facebook currently is. You know, it might be metaverse, we have no idea what it is. So is regulation something that can actually catch up to emerging technology? Are you optimistic about the future relationship between law and policy and technology? I'll just say really quickly, it's hard for me to be optimistic about anything that requires Congress right now to agree and pass a law. So, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you know, Jeff's work in, in bringing together this group to make these recommendations and more and more of those kind of things are going to be helpful, but it's just really hard to pass anything now, even, even things that, you know, are nonpartisan. And part of the problem is nothing is nonpartisan. Right. Um, so... Uh, if, if Congress were to enact a law of this sort, uh, it would likely be uh, a partisan law where they were predicting this will be used in a way that benefits me, that benefits us. And they're not so concerned about the country, unfortunately. Um, so I, I, I do think, again, this comes back to the point about distrust, um, that Politicians act very much at a partisan self-interest in lots of ways. And allowing them to regulate speech 
or social media or newspapers or, ma or magazines has always been something that has been a subject of great distrust. Um, and for the most part, I think that's been sane. And even now, you know, if you could create an agency, but when I talked earlier about creating an agency, the idea was to create an agency like the Federal Communications Commission, where you have several levels of appointments by both parties, and they have to be approved by the other party. And the idea is to try to find some neutral body that can make these decisions. And if you could do that, I, I'm all in favor of it. Um, but you need to have both sides agree that this is a good thing for the law to be passed. And right now, that's not so easy. Thank you both so much. This has been so informative and interesting. And um, thank you all for joining us. I don't know if the, oh, oh, what a surprise. Um, I, I, what an what a interesting, thought-provoking, valuable day. Um, we want to invite you now to join us uh, upstairs on the 10th floor uh, for a cocktail hour, have a chance to visit with each other, and then we're, we're, uh, we'll have dinner uh, down here in this room following that cocktail uh, reception. So I look forward to uh, seeing you up there and then down here again. Thank you. <laughs>